Thanks so much, everyone, for being here. I'm having such a great time. Everyone here is so friendly and welcoming and open, and it's just great. So I'm going to get right into it. I have a lot to cover, so apologies if I talk a little faster than usual. Um, and I also have to give a shout out to March Against Myths for this icon you see here, the, the fork with the raised fist. And that's supposed to evoke um, the idea of justice when it comes to food. Oh, I need my clicker. So first, a little bit about me. This is a still from the Science Moms movie, if any of you had a chance to attend the world premiere. So I'm a communicator and a columnist and a mom and an activist. And I cover everything from food and health and science, medicine and parenting. And of course, it's fashionable now to also cover Gwyneth Paltrow's latest gaffes. But I have been doing it since well before it was cool. So I can claim that. But um, more importantly, I would suggest that I cover the intersections of these issues. And these are intersections that aren't always obvious, right? And first, a disclaimer. As I'll explain in more detail, GMO, which stands for Genetically Modified Organism, since it's such a meaningless and broad term that uh, brings up such a vast terrain of subject matter, I can't possibly cover all of it, right? And I also can't claim to be an expert in any of these subjects. Rather, I kind of collate and share um, research and science. So my hope is that at the end of hearing from me today, you'll see that GMO, and I put that in quotes, shout out to the I Heart GMO t-shirt, by the way. Yeah. Um, so where was I before that shout out? Um, it, covers, it covers so much more than we typically consider, and the impact is so much bigger than, um, than I can begin to cover here today. Now, uh, uh, again, a little bit more about me, and I promise, I think this is the last picture of me. This is what I look like often following a trip to the supermarket, and sometimes it's because I have my kids with me and they're tired and they're whiny, but um, usually it's because of this. This is a lot of what you see in the American grocery aisle, so much nonsense, and it's plastered all over our food. Now, what you see here, is a little different than what you'll see um, in the UK, but I have looked at some food labeling here, because I'm a food labeling geek, and there is similar nonsense here. Now, in the US, and you won't see this again in the UK, one of the most ubiquitous and equally meaningless uh, labels is the Non-GMO Project. It's a third-party group which I will tell anyone is responsible for sp spreading fear and misinformation about our food. And it's absolutely plastered all over our supermarkets, right? So you see here a uh, tomato labeled non-GMO project. What most people wouldn't know is that there are no genetically engineered tomatoes on the market right now. Um, and I should mention that Non-GMO project labeled food is so big, last year food with this label sold $19 billion, and it's growing very quickly. You also see um, this label kind of uh, suggests healthfulness, but of course we have organic hot fudge sauce. It must be healthy though, right? Because it's got a non-GMO project and it's organic. But even more ridiculous is, okay, well these are chips, not as ridiculous as the next one, Salt, and my favorite, cat litter, because only the best non-GMO products, right, for our cats to pee in. <laughs> but the thing is, the non-GMO project label tells us absolutely nothing meaningful about our food. It doesn't tell us anything about nutrition. It doesn't tell us about the substances and practices used when growing these crops. It doesn't tell us about working conditions for farmers or for factory workers. And it doesn't even tell us whether the seed variety was patented, because as, as many people don't understand, most seed varieties are patented, and many of them can be sold as organic or non-GMO. Now, there's no equivalent to non-GMO project or other non-GMO labels 
in the UK um, for a couple reasons, including that there are no commercially grown genetically engineered foods here, crops, excuse me, and because grocers have largely decided not to stock genetically engineered products or ingredients derived from them um, to avoid market losses and to not have to deal with very strict EU labeling laws. Now, for me, again, because I'm such a food science geek, it's enough to make me want to, oops, Oh, see, you guys saw this already. It's enough to make you want to plank in the aisles, right? And um, I really, really want a picture of me doing this, so if anyone wants to come with me, we'll do that later. <laughs> but it's, it's so frustrating. And this is a real guy, and this is a, um, a photo that's available on Wikipedia, by the way. So now we'll get into a little uh, bit of a background on why you don't see this labeling in the UK. Now, this is the product that ushered in brief commercial success, followed by activist opposition, and, and then it ultimately resulted in consumer rejection of genetically engineered crops in the UK. And I have to say thanks to Dr. Alan Mahugan for this photo of the Sainsbury tomato puree. And as you see, it's clearly labeled made with genetically modified tomatoes. So the first genetically engineered crop product to be commercialized, made by Calgene, was the Flavor Saver Tomato. And it was engineered to slow ripening and to resist softening, which extends its shelf life, reduces waste. So evidence available in the 80s suggested that the tomato fruit enzyme polygalactio... It's a, it's a tongue twister. Polygalacturonase was the key to fruit softening because of its ability to dissolve cell wall pectin. So researchers were able to suppress the formation of the enzyme by inserting an antisense copy of the gene designed to drastically reduce the formation of it. So in 1996, Zeneca, under license, introduced the, um, this tomato paste made from these antisense tomatoes grown and processed in California. Nearly two million cans of this um, were sold from 96 through 1999. The reduction in waste and the extended shelf life actually allowed about an 18 to 20 percent reduction in cost. So that's a good thing for consumers. So it initially outsold conventional tomato paste um, at many locations, but sales declined dramatically in 98, following media attention of pressure from lobbying groups, spreading scare stories. So subsequently, Safeway and Sainsbury's decided to get rid of any genetically modified products from their shelves um, to satisfy the needs of some vocal consumers. Not necessarily a majority, but the most vocal ones. Not for any reason of food safety or any other substantial reason. Now, in retrospect, is it possible that if these cans were labeled something like engineered to extend, extend shelf life, um, it would have been maybe less creepy rather than labeling them genetically modified? And maybe that these groups that opposed it would have had a harder time demonizing the technology. I think so, but more on that coming up. But you see here, that the headlines shown grocers capitulating the fear, but the media didn't always show that the consumer rejection was planted and was stoked by these groups with ideological and or financial motives. So, first, I'd like to maybe just pull the audience. Some of you may be very well versed on what GMO means, so I mean, what does it bring to mind when you hear GMO? Uh, maybe you can just shout it out, or what have you heard from friends or family? Come on. Yeah, Franken food? Golden rice. Golden rice. Anything else? Okay, well, I'll, I'll answer for you what, what it brings up for a lot of people. So, GMO has become a metaphor or a scapegoat, you could say, for these broad anxieties about the food system, including obesity, monoculture, 
patenting of life forms, allergies, and corporate control of the food system, and by extension, corporate control of the population, um, pesticides, and of course, the big, bad M word, Monsanto, right? But we have to remember that, um, oops. Okay, there we go. We have to remember that these concerns are justified, right? There are justified anxieties about our family's well-being, about our health and corporate and government corruption, and the environment. And these are concerns that people like me try to allay with data and with facts, but ironically enough, the data show that, that um, addressing these concerns with facts and with citations doesn't work if you don't first address the underlying justified concerns. So what does GMO actually mean? Uh, scientifically, it means nothing. As I said, whether or not a whole food or an ingredient comes from a GMO crop tells us absolutely nothing other than the breeding technique. Again, not, it doesn't tell us about whether pesticides were used or which ones, environmental impact, conditions during growing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is not what GMO is. There's no GMO with uh, fish genes or apples with, uh, I don't know, what kind of genes, snake genes or whatever. Um, it's a process, not a product. So when we are looking at effects on people and on the environment, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at traits, not um, whether or not something is a GMO. So here you see a few crops that either have been improved and or saved with biotechnology, or um, in the case of citrus, it's in the works. So here are some crop modification techniques, and I have to thank Biology Fortified for this infographic here, and it describes a few. And uh, the only difference between any of these is that um, all transgenic crops, and now some genome-edited crops, are considered to be GMO by governments and third parties. Um, the rest of these modification techniques result in crops that are eligible to be grown and sold as organic or non-GMO. And in case I hadn't made it clear earlier, I should do that now, that organic agriculture prohibits the use of um, transgenic crops and um, probably will do for genome editing crops. So there is a uh, reason for the denigration by the organic industry of GMOs. Now, none of these methods are more or less inherently risky than any of the others, and every major scientific body around the world agrees on that. So the consensus that crop improvement by the modern molecular techniques of biotechnology is as safe as the conventional methods, this, this consensus is absolutely ironclad, it's solid. But um, as you see, for example, mutagenesis, is, I mean, when people look at the natural versus unnatural false dichotomy, if you look at mutagenesis, it's, it's totally unnatural, right? Scientists um, use either radiation or chemicals with the intention of scrambling this uh, organism's DNA, kind of hoping for a lucky card, you can say, and when a beneficial trait arises, it's commercialized and sold, and we have lots of foods that were created in this way. Um, but again, they can be sold as organic and non-GMO. So what we have to look at is who and what is responsible for this misinformation. And as I go through some of these, keep in mind that the misinformation isn't always about the science of genetic engineering. In and of itself, it's about the fabrication of this non-existent category, this GMO, which is then painted as a Goliath against which those with these ideological and or financial motives can pit themselves as Davids, and it's a very compelling narrative. 
And so it's about stoking the fear of these consumers and positioning this non-existent GMO category that so-called responsible consumers avoid. So the first group that um, is responsible for the spread of this nonsense is what I refer to as the fear babes. So they're babes because they're attractive either in a conventional way or in some other way. We want to be like them. So you see here a few examples. Dr. Oz, the famous American or infamous American television doctor, Gwyneth Paltrow, of course, and Devani, the food babe, Hari. And um, these, these people are really, really good at what they do. We have to give them that much, right? Then we have anti-GMO activist groups. And this one pictured here is known as March Against Monsanto. And this is a photograph I think that I took or either a friend of mine who was there counter-protesting. And calling themselves March Against Monsanto was perhaps one of the most brilliant moves on their part. Um, because, you know, they started as an opposition to this corporate control of our food system, this idea that Monsanto was making us sick. And I, I won't speak to my thoughts on Monsanto um, and their business practices, excuse me, but um, this, this particular group and many like them are just um, troves of pseudoscience. They're not only anti-GMO, they're anti-vaccine, they believe in chemtrails. They've even hosted um, blog posts by moon landing conspiracy theorists. So this is kind of like the guts of, of Wu is pictured here. And it's, again, this is also a compelling nat narrative that they present. They're just the people and they want what's good, right? And I think a lot of these people believe in what they're saying. And then we have um, spreaders of misinformation uh, disguised as consumer advocacy groups. And a couple of these are probably familiar to you. So the um, Soil Association is the UK's largest organic, organic certification body. And then, of course, Greenpeace, which uh, in some corners of the of the population is known for destroying test fields of important biotech crops. And then we also have, um, oh, before I move on, the media, of course, uh, kind of unskeptically will uh, put out information about the effects of GMOs on our health or on the environment. And um, we have marketing disguised as consumer research. Does this look familiar to anyone? The or it's from the viral organic effect video from 2015. So it's a chart from this video the, when the Coop chain of grocery stores, they're known as a pioneer for organic food in Sweden, they conducted an experiment on a family of five for three weeks. Um, never mind that a sample size of five doesn't really mean much, right? So the family which had eaten a conventional diet to keep food costs down switched to organic for two weeks, giving daily urine samples. And like magic, the um, agricultural chemicals disappeared from this little boy's urine. So, I mean, look at him. He's just this delicate child, and we just want to protect him. So, of course, we don't want agricultural, agricultural chemicals, pesticides, in his body. But what this experiment didn't look at was the chemicals used in organic agriculture. Did not even take a look. But um, headlines uh, read something like, a new study suggests that just two weeks of eating a changed diet is enough to drastically reduce the amount of lingering ag chemicals. Now, the public latched on to the narrative, and although Coop recently lost a lawsuit for misleading advertising, the damage was already done. This, this um, narrative is now part of how people see things. And then we have organic industry marketing. Now, on your left here, you see stills from a video known as Mr. Seed, put out by um, some organic industry folks. And it really made a lot of American farmers angry because it was raunchy and in poor taste. And if you see here, it compared um, GMO seeds 
and the farmers who grow them to coke addicts. You see this guy, these uh, two big kind of uh, steroid-filled GMO seeds, like snorting this stuff called Poundup. Very clever, right? And then um, next to that, you see the sign, what is organic? And this is so common in grocery stores, supermarkets, farmers markets, everywhere. And this particular sign is from a store just next to my house. And I would walk past it all the time and be very annoyed. But I spoke to the store manager, and he didn't realize that what this sign says is wrong. And he took the sign down, which made me very, very pleased in my own little way. But what it says here is, Protose is grown without chemical pesticides or fertilizers. Well, of course, we know all pesticides and fertilizers are made of chemicals and that they are used in organic agriculture. Crops are not genetically modified. That depends, of course, on how you define it. And that farming practices protect the ecosystem and conserve natural resources. So we often see the story of organic farmers as uh, stewards of the earth. We hear that a lot. And the truth is, conventional farmers can and do, do use many or almost all, depending on the operation, methods that organic farmers uh, use to preserve our, uh, our resources. And they tend to do it more efficiently with less land per calorie produced. Now, whether or not organic farmers think that misleading consumers is a good idea, and when I speak to a lot of for organic farmers, they, they aren't exactly for that, about, for uh, misleading consumers. Um, the organic industry trend of intentionally misleading the public to increase market share is clear, it's demonstrable. And part of that trend is implicit or explicit denigration of GMOs. And they always refer to them as GMOs. They won't say something like, oh, you know, I really don't like that apple that used RNA interference to silence browning, right? They're not that specific. So this 2014 analysis explains that there's this widespread organic industry pattern of research-informed and intentionally deceptive marketing and advocacy-related practices, and that has a tangible influence on uh, c consumer purchasing practices. So consumer misconceptions about pesticides and the environment and nutrition and safety have this significant influence. And these industries do very little to clear them off, and they often add fuel to the misinformation fire, if you will. And, of course, we have ourselves to blame a little bit. Here we go. I think my slides are maybe out of order. Um, anyway, we have ourselves to blame a little bit, um, because, partially because of the Dunning-Kruger effect. We have this uh, confidence in our ability to do research on Google, right? So, yes, we've established that genetic engineering is a set of safe breeding techniques. So what does that have to do with justice? The most obvious one is traits, traits that have obvious justice implications. So the first one I'll illustrate with a short video clip from the critically acclaimed recent documentary called Food Evolution, um, which my group March Against Myths actually appears in. And if any of you are familiar with Zen Honeycutt. Um, it kind of shows me having an argument with her, but um, if, you, if you've seen it, I hope it was flattering. I don't know. But anyway, here's the video. I think I could just... Oops. There we go. Many farmers realized there was a strange disease wiping out banners. We did not know how to go about it, but to cut down infected plants, but the disease kept on spreading. That is poverty. That is famine. Famine. My name is Emanelli Mamugera. 
I practice integrated organic farming. I also teach farmers how to do the same. Right now, banana wilt is not affecting me, but it has affected many people. Banana bacterial wilt can spread from one farm to another at any time. That's why I teach these farmers. You can never get any disease, like banana wilt or something. My dear, you have to guard against it. Don't let people come into your garden. Don't share tools. Like you see, that is a tool rack. All the tools we use in this garden, we never use them anywhere else. If you must, you disinfect. All these are preventive measures. They're not really curative measures. She could not get food for herself or for her family, so she's devastated. Once someone is hit, you have to just cut down, burn, and wait for maybe six months to a year for it to get out of the garden. Ningama papa ali tetsobola. I would call it the Ebola of the banana. It comes and wipes away the whole plantation. <clears throat> so among the most, yeah, among one of the most devastating realities in Uganda and in East Africa where it comes to these starchy bananas which make up around 30% of the average person's caloric intake is that there is a genetically engineered version, uh, engineered with a sweet pepper gene, just excellent at resisting this banana xanthomonas wilt. And this is a good example of um, when other breeding methods are too slow or won't work, partially because banana plants are essentially sterile. But, um, due in large part to our Western rejection and opposition to genetic engineering, um, the big bad GMO, this wilt-resistant solution, has been languishing in Parliament, um, largely because the EU's ideological regulatory framework is applied directly in Africa. But, um, a spoiler alert, there is some hope in Uganda uh, in particular where Parliament voted this long-awaited National Biosafety Act of 2017 into law uh, just about a week ago now, and the President is expected to sign it, um, but I'm hopeful that now farmers like these will be able to use these tools that they so much need. If, if you look, or if you watched Food Evolution, you'll see that when this specific farmer, Francis Nansen, learns about the genetically engineered variety of this banana, she's just appalled that she's not allowed to use it. So here you see a brief quote from my recent interview with Sir Richard Roberts, and he says you don't see a lot of thin Europeans. Um, I'm not sure that's not quite true, but you see the point that he's making is that we in the West can, you know, can choose not to eat GMOs, but it's a luxury for us. Now another trait, oops, is BT. There are a few types of BT crops, including cotton, eggplant, uh, which is also known as brinjal, and others, but I'll use cotton as an example here. Um, and BT, by the way, stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a bacteria, and a specific ba uh, bacteria expressed by this um, sorry, a specific protein expressed by this bacteria has insecticidal properties um, to specific insects. Um, so from the USA to India, Burkina Faso, um, farmers have embraced this cotton. 
It's had the effect of a massive net reduction in pesticide use and an increase in farmer incomes. So with bollworm and other pests wreaking havoc on cotton crops, uh, BT cotton first found its way to Indian farmland. And this wasn't forcibly from big Western corporations, right? It was through a black market, where when farmers were taking this BT cotton and breeding them with their own local cotton varieties. So, faced with widespread planting of these illegal crops, it was clear because you could see um, this image is from an American farmer, but it's, it's similar anywhere. You can see that strip in the middle, which wasn't BT, it just didn't make it. So, anti-GM activists fought to keep this illegal in India, but the government first approved BT cotton in 2002. Now, <laughs> next to it, you see a screenshot of a piece I wrote about this company called Packed Apparel, and they sell panties that don't harm people. So they're very proud of themselves about this, and you can feel good also about wearing these organic cotton panties, and they have undershirts and other products. And if you look on their uh, website, and even um, you, you might be familiar with some of this marketing that comes across on Facebook and other places, um, this is responsible underwear. It keeps farmers from committing suicide, which is, uh, I, I mean, I could give a whole talk on the GMO farmer um, suicide myth. But it's so strange to me that um, this is a still from a packed apparel advertisement. They fetishize the archaic, and this is just one example of it. Um, and I hate to quote myself, but I didn't want to reinvent that wheel. But basically, what I'm saying is there's this imagery of these downtrodden families in dirt-floored huts and these crude tools like the short-handled weeding tool, which of course doesn't need to be used with BT cotton because um, there's also not, you know, you don't have to hand weed. But this type of short-handled tool depicted in Pact's ad was outlawed in California in the 1970s because it's considered an unsafe hand tool that's very injurious to the body. And a report from the International Fund for Agricultural Development um, explains that in certain countries in Africa, culturally, use of the longer-handled, safer kind of tool is considered lazy especially for women. So if you are a woman doing the right thing in a farm, you're supposed to be bending over and hurting your back. So whether or not the farms from which PAC sources its cotton actually use these short-handled tools extensively, to glorify them is nothing short of uh, just awful and a fairy tale. And then, of course, one of you mentioned golden rice earlier, and I think Wait a minute, yeah, golden rice. And I won't spend a lot of time on it, but um, it's another crop that's been languishing, kind of, and not reaching the people who really need it. Now, there are less obvious ways, less obvious than these traits, that GMO, anti-GMO, and organic perpetuate injustice. First, uh, oops. I don't know, it gives us this false sense of responsibility and of morality even. You know, we can pat ourselves on the back if we buy organic or non-GMO because then we're helping the environment. We're helping preserve this natural state and natural has become almost like a religion, right? Um, and of course, we think that we reap health benefits, but it also gives us this vague sense of responsibility that we are um, improving labor conditions with our purchases, um, and that these labels address economic, class-based, or even race-based disparities. And of course, the sexism so inherent in pitting moms against moms. And I, I hope that some of you did see the Science Moms documentary, because that's exactly part of what it's talking about. And there's a reason that this movie had to start, because the mommy wars are so centered around food, right? And there's perhaps no better example of this than 
Zen Honeycutt, the founder of a group called Moms Across America. And she says uh, in the Food Evolution documentary, actually, this quote is from, she says, I trust the social media more than most medical doctors, more than the CDC, more than the FDA, and more than the EPA. She doesn't need a scientific study. She just, you know, trusts her gut. And that plays almost too well into the stereotype that women's and moms can't, won't, or shouldn't think with the rational part of our brains because we're supposed to tap into this vague mommy instinct, which to me is very insulting. <laughs> and then um, you see imagery like this. This is a billboard um, that was erected in Times Square last year by March Against Monsanto, by the way. Now, think about how much a billboard in Times Square probably costs. I haven't looked at those statistics, but it's quite a bit, Times Square, uh, New York. It's prime, prime billboard location. And there are obvious and not so obvious reasons that this is sexist, and I could just spend a while unpacking why, and I wish I could get into it. But um, what's particularly appalling here is that this type of anti-woman rhetoric is coming from a movement that opposes technologies that will allow children, and especially girls, to go to school and toil over their schoolwork rather than toiling in the fields and then grow up having to use things like these short-handled tools that hurt their backs. And it's a rhetoric that ignores real problems that uh, women face in the agricultural workforce and factories all over the world. And none of these problems are caused by GMOs. And it ignores that inequitable, excuse me, inequitable access to healthy food causes real health disparities, both in the developed and in the developing world. So if I had to boil it all down to one sentence, of less obvious ways GMO and anti-GMO perpetuate injustice, it's that as a concept, GMO helps assuage consumers, allowing us to overlook injustices where the food system intersects with policy and with society. So in the spirit of science moms opening this weekend, I'll close with a quote from one of the science moms, Dr. Leila Kadirai, and she says, blaming GMOs for agricultural or socioeconomic problems that are broad in scope deters efforts of finding genuine solutions to these issues, and it demonizes a promising crop breeding technology. So with that, I'm glad that we have time for some questions, and I hope you have a lot of them. Oops. Um, and that is where you can find me. We do indeed have time for questions, so feel free to queue up next to the microphone. Um, one of the concerns, you know, speaking as a mother, um, one of the concerns about GMOs uh, is in the same way as when we invaded the New World, quote unquote, we introduced species that had very severe uh, ecosystem effects. So one of the concerns about GMOs is about introducing new variants into, uh, into ecosystems and the potential effects of them. Do you have any comments or information on that? Yeah, and um, again, as I mentioned, these, this is a justified concern, and it comes up quite a lot. But um, yeah, we, absolutely, we should be worried about invasive species or effects of, um, of species on the environment. But again, this, this isn't unique to GMOs, right? It could be unique, it could happen with any breeding technique. And so again, this idea of GMO um, kind of lets the other ones off the hook. Um, with groups like March Against Monsanto clearly being biased and thus not what I would call trustworthy as a source of information, it's, they're obviously very critical of Monsanto and the likes of them. Um, 
it's hard, therefore, to find anyone else who is critical who I feel like would be trustworthy. And so it's hard to get a sense for whether this is a company I should think is a decent company, just being a biotech company as normal, or is there actually anything there? Is there anything actually rightly criticized the, about them? Um, and I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or if you have any sources of information that might be a bit unbiased about whether these companies are good or not. Yeah, so that's one of the hardest things, right, is to know who to trust and what information to trust. Um, I certainly don't think Monsanto is perfect, uh, but they have a huge communication problem. And I also know for a fact that uh, most of what people oppose about the company is based in myth. For example, that they sue farmers for unintentional seed drift. That's never actually happened. But um, that's it. And what was the second part of your question? Uh, did you have a second part? Oh, is there anyone else that opposes Monsanto which is, that are considered to be credible? Yes, I mean, um, the thing with this movement, this anti-GMO movement, is they're really good at cherry picking, not only data, but also cherry picking experts and scientists who will speak to their side. So sure, there are a few uh, doctors and scientists that will say, Monsanto's awful and they're out to kill us. And um, because the public doesn't necessarily understand that, um, uh, that one expert doesn't mean a whole lot, it's a very successful tactic. Thank you for the talk. Oh, well, we're supposed to not say that, sorry. <laughs> I was told earlier. As somebody who's been involved as a skeptic and in the green movement for a long time, I've obviously a bit of cognitive dissonance trying to get all these issues in my head. The one thing that still worries me is the monoculture issue, which is one of your words that came up earlier. Um, I, myself and people in the green movement, I think we're still under the impression that a lot of GMO is about being able to grow things in a monoculture so that they are resistant to certain chemicals or whatever. So is, is that not the case? Is that not what most GMOs are doing? And, and is this a concern for the, you know, as an environmental issue? Yeah, um, so this is a question of policy and of subsidies. And um, I was jokingly called, I don't know if um, Miles Power is here on his podcast, he jokingly called me a shill for tiny aggro. Because, um, because really, uh, the opposition to GMOs, what happens is it creates this um, regulatory arena in which it is so uh, financially difficult uh, to bring a GM product, what we call a genetically engineered product from research to market, that it kind of helps uh, keep, uh, keep the status quo, right? If we could use GE technology to grow things like apples and broccoli and um, uh, fruits and vegetables in a better way and in a more sustainable way, that would be great, wouldn't it? But um, right now, that's just not possible. So. GMO as a label has picked up a lot of baggage with the general public. Do you think maybe that as a term may be a lost cause? And do you think there may be a, another label that could be pivoted to by the industry? Yeah, so this is a debate that happens uh, a lot in this area, whether or not we need to drop GMO and whether it's even possible. So um, it's hard for me to get into everything I think about that. I mean, if I could, if I could just wave a wand and get rid of the word and um, the term, sorry, and you know, it never happened and we were labeling things more precisely, I think that would be ideal, but um, but now it's kind of just everywhere, so it's a question of how to battle that, and that's, that's a very big question. Any more questions? I have one, if not. Um, do you mind? I, I was gonna say, are there any um, companies that are directly profiting from, wait, wait there, I wrote this down so I can actually say it right, um, that are profiting from the fact that GMOs are being held back? Because obviously we're seeing a lot of these sort of organic markets. Is that getting bigger? Because I imagine past the point they're going to be, you know, opening big organic food shops and those guys will want to really keep people off GMOs. Well, um, I'm not sure if you've heard the news that Amazon recently acquired Whole Foods. So the short answer to that question is yes, companies, <laughs> well, well, Amazon's business model isn't quite based on profit, right? 
but there are companies that are, that are absolutely profiting from uh, denigrating the, their competitors. If you're familiar with a marketing tactic known as FUD, uh, F-U-D, which stands for Fear, Uncertainty, and Doubt, it was first introduced by, or first employed by Microsoft in the 90s to scare people about what would happen if, uh, if they use their competitor's product, and it's now being used very successfully in the food industry. Yeah. Real good. I think one more round of applause for Kogan Sinatra, please.